Good morning. You've joined us for another episode of The View, our special Valentine's Day Side with Love episode. <laughs> I know that no, <laughs> no matter what I say, Aisha and Jessica are going to talk about the weather. So let's just go right there. Aisha and Jessica, any weather out your way? Listen, I'm Aisha Hauser in Seattle, and here's what you need to know. We have very few plows in the entire state. Very few. So when it snows, it's not a matter of us being wimpy or anything like that. I feel it's difficult to even leave the house because the streets can't be plowed for hours, sometimes days. So really, cabin fever sets in pretty quickly because you go through the avocados pretty fast. So, yeah, Jessica, I ran out of avocados really early on. I actually I made guacamole you, I with all of them. You did. Yeah. You texted me. You were I, I was like, I'm out of avocados. <laughs> it was, I mean, and the stores, I sent my husband, we live only a quarter mile from a grocery store. My son and husband went, they, they my son had to FaceTime me to prove there was no meat. I said, can you get some, because we're omnivores here. We're not one of the vegans. No, no shade to vegans. Love them. However, we do eat the meat and nothing, literally the entire, and then I said, can you get some celery? We can make tuna fish. Nothing. They were FaceTiming me because I was I was not going to believe them that nothing was there, but it was there was nothing. But mind you, within 24 hours, it was all replenished. So I kind of call bullshit on capitalism. Right. I'm with you on that. I'm with literally you it was that. all back. And Trader Joe's, same thing. A a empty shelves and they were already getting so anyway. I'm good otherwise, Jessica. Yeah, I survived as well. I'm not as near a grocery store as you. I'm out on an island. So, um, and then I'm way out. And then I'm, you know, there's like long driveways out here. And there's, it is a little bit scary. There's, um, you know, people who get stuck down the long driveways who don't have any kind of plower. They're too old to dig themselves out and they don't have power. And so it is, it does get, it does get a little scary after like five days of being snowed in when you're not used to it. I did see somebody raking their driveway, <laughs> like in an attempt, like, I don't know, did, they don't have a shovel. I'm not really sure what, but what that was about, but I was like, okay, well, we're all gonna do what we can do. You know, if you've got a rake, use it. Like, why not? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> How well, was the, the weather? Families, we're one of the few families that have shovels because we moved from New Hampshire. So we had, but everybody was saying they sold out. Somebody was hoeing the snow because they yes. had all that they <laughs> garden with. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So I need to know, cause I don't know what the weather was like anywhere else. What, what about you, Christina? How was the weather where you are? Um, it has been super, super cold. Um, really, what really cold. mean in Charlottesville, Virginia, super, it, super cold. So we had um, a couple of overnight six degree, eight degree nights, which for us is, is really out of the norm. Um, and then two nights ago, we had um, weather delay for schools because of freezing rain, overnight freezing rain. So it's just enough for a director of admin and finance to you know get really tense as you're driving up to church um, in the morning to just see what fresh heck awaits you. Um, and not wood. Uh, everything here has been great so far. Fresh heck, who are you? I know, right? I know. <laughs> I am in church. Like, say the hell word. That's a little bit much. All the other curse words are different. And so, <laughs> so Meg, how's it going there? Well, we, you know, we got about a foot of snow this week, but we are built for snow. But what I have, which I can whine about with the best of them is ice dams. This is where your gutters get full of ice and then icicles drip. Right now there is water dripping through my kitchen light fixtures. And I have, I'm paying someone to come and rake my roof and use very hot water and melt these dams for hundreds of dollars. And they are so backed up because everyone has them that I won't get them for another couple of days, at which point who knows what will have dripped through my house. Now, here's the good news. The first year that water dripped through my light fixtures, I freaked out and I called an electrician and he said, turn the light off. And I said, well, I'm not stupid. The light is off. And he said, oh, it'll be fine then. And you know what it was? It dried out and it was fine a few days later. So. So the one coming through the kitchen at least goes into the sink, which it's doing right now. But the ones in the bedrooms and stuff, 
that's really unpleasant. So though we are built for snow, my house clearly has insulation problems and they could be fixed for thousands of dollars. And I'm beginning to think I, if I'd done that 15 years ago, I would have saved money. But every year I'm like, no, I'm gonna sell the house. So why do it? So that's my little saga. But, um, and I got a ticket because, you know, here you move the car on Tuesdays and Thursdays and, you know, it's snow emergencies are very regulated and I got it wrong. So I got a parking ticket for being on the wrong side of the street, which is more um, insulting than, I mean, the money sucks, but it's like to blow that is to show that you're not a good Minnesotan because everyone knows how to do this. But I will say when we lived in DC and it snowed, I went out the first day and I was like, now, which side of the street should we park on? And the neighbor said, why? And I said, for the plows. And they said, there are no plows here. And then they said, oh, a plow came through in the 60s. It hit a car. We've never seen one since. And we had, it was the blizzard in 96. There was three feet of snow. We had to shovel that shit. We had to shovel that stuff out one shovel at a time to get our cars out. And of course, having just moved there and thinking it was hilarious that they would ever worry about snow. I didn't own a shovel. I was just like, oh, because <laughs> every time there was snow two states away, they would freak out. So I had no belief that it would actually. But global climate change, now D.C. schools shut all the time. It's really changed. They have a lot of snow out there. So it was really different when I was there in the 90s. So I also need to so say that to every spend... church, every UU church on mm -hmm. last Sunday, within, I don't know, two hours of each other, Jessica, was closed for worship. Nobody had worship on Sunday which I think is unprecedented. I think we that's need to send the, We need to send the rake, the raking from the raking people from <laughs> the raking in the Pacific Northwest to Meg's house. Well, roof <laughs> rakes are a particular thing that they're sold out of here, but they're these long kind of, yeah, I have one. It's just that with my bad rotator cuff, I can't get to the roof and do it. So I'm paying someone else. Margalee, so, is it Asia, mellow? Is, what, what name went out in the in the online poll? Well, Asia, for those people who don't know, while Asia was getting cabin fever, she had an online poll going as to the name of this weather event. In the what what one? Um, I have to look it up, but I think in, it, ahead was um, Snow Ragnarok was, uh, uh, no, uh, Snow Apocalypse was in the lead. Snow Mageddon, Snow Apocalypse, and Snow Magad, S N O M G. Oh, I like Snow Magad. That That's was from really Scott like Prinster. Cool. Shout out to Scott. <laughs> Snow Apocalypse cool. Now was the one that I Snow think. Snow Apocalypse the... Now was, was the third storm coming in. My husband's like, it's Snow Apocalypse Now. And I. Anything anybody was saying, I was just posting on Facebook. Okay, maybe that's enough weather, but Margalee, how are you today? I am great. Uh, coming to you from um, Cromwell, Connecticut, and um, our weather woes are nowhere near yours. Yes, on Monday we were closed um, because of weather, but it hasn't been bad at all. So I am on Facebook, uh, Twitter. So I'm just gonna be with you the rest of the hour. Welcome, welcome everyone. So we're excited today to be bringing Elizabeth Wynn, the Organizing Strategy Director, and Everett Thompson, the Side With Love Campaign Manager, to talk about what's up with that. But first, just a quick stop at what's new with UUism. Christina, you wanted to mention the appointments. Yeah, I wanted to give a shout out to the appointments, the UUA, um, Board of Trustees uh, has an appointments committee and the appointments committee came up with a really fantastic um, working group covenant that I'm, I encourage people to check out. It's on their Facebook page. The appointments committee has their own Facebook page. And um, I just thought it was a beautiful way to agree to go into really faithful work. And uh, what did you, what was special about it? What did you like about it? I liked that they took the time to make it. <laughs> you know, so often that uh, we go into denominational work, just like, Ooh, what is, you know, so focused on what needs to get done um, and that they were really thoughtful about um, how to center voices from the margins, but also um, just to be really intentional about how they were going to work together. That's great. I'll have to take a look at that. I saw it was there, but I must admit I did not read it. Uh, GA is coming up. They just announced what's going to happen. 
told people if, if our stuff got through. I'm happy to say the CLF worship service got through. It's our only time of the year. We're going to focus this year really deeply on our prison ministry, voices of people who are incarcerated who won't be there, but will bring their voices. We are now about 900 CLF members who are currently incarcerated. So I'm, I'm excited about that. And I'm very excited to be talking with the Side with Love folks. Um, Everett, you are in the South now. Can you share where you are? And also, um, you're the campaign manager. What, how, what brought you to this? Great. Um, but first, I just want to say, um, like, love. Love to y'all. Uh, love to folks who are listening, feeling, and being in this moment. Um, and uh, love on this capitalist, I mean, this wonderful day. That is Valentine's Day. Um, and may we all be free and get free. Um, and so, yes, I'm a Southerner by birth and by choice. I'm born and raised in a very huge town, a green level, North Carolina, um, and where all my cousins and aunties and uncles and my, well, my big, my big cousin is the mayor there. Shout out GL. And um, I live outside of Atlanta. I live in uh, a place called East Point, Georgia, home of Outcast. Um, and I've been here now for about 10 years. And so, uh, I like to say that I am an organizer. It is my skill and my craft. Um, but most importantly, I'm a person of faith um, who believes that, um, you know, justice, uh, love is justice. And justice asks of us to put all our things and center our love and center our belief that everyone is sacred and um, actually deserve dignity to move toward and forward and through, through this work and through this life. So um, what brought me to side with love? Uh, one, I... I, I, a good comrade uh, named Susan Leslie um, and that works at the UA um, was, uh, has been a friend, has been working with me over some years with this group called the Interfaith Organized Initiative. Um, and the IOI, which we call, um, we state that prophetic faith um, demands prophetic action. And by doing that work and working with Susan and hearing her talk on and on about how great the UA is and was, um, I was like, hmm, I'm curious. And then secondly, uh, we did some work together in Ohio um, last year where in Ohio we were beating back, uh, um, we were actually pushing for a ballot initiative where um, we would actually reclassify felonies uh, to, uh, to misdemeanors and get folks out of jail um, and also access to systems to allow them to live a life with dignity. Um, so um, making sure folks can have SNAP benefits, um, housing, um, health care, um, and for their loved ones, um, particularly for nonviolent offenses. Um, so a ballot initiative that's, um, we were able to get over 300,000 people, everyday Ohioans, to actually say, yes, we want this. Um, and it became a ballot a measure. Um, but unfortunately, uh, we lost that fight. But at, the, at that time, we were able to get a lot of UUs and other faith folks out on the ground, knocking on doors, talking to people from the place of their faith. Um, uh, President Susan Frederick Gray came down, Carrie McDonald came down, and they too was, um, had their sneakers on, knocking, talking to folks, um, and actually being with community, uh, being with those um, affected and affected by the issue itself and really talked about it from a place of, this is what love looks like. This is how we put ourselves in the picture and on the line for justice. And we're gonna go bold and go hard. And even though we didn't win here, it set an example and also gave us some really great tools and thoughts around how we wanna do this work differently moving forward. So from there, I, I fell in love and said, hey, side with love is where I wanna come. And um, they graciously gave me an interview and now they're stuck with me. I came in on December third, and so until they say we're done with you, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna be here. Thank you so much. And you know, with all of the ballot initiatives we lost on marriage equality, the slogan was "Fail Forward," and it sounds like that's what happened. And we had guests on from Florida where they reenfranchised uh, what 1.6 million people, and you know, it's just inspiring all of this work that's going on. It's really good get out the vote work too. Ohio didn't go super well overall, Mike relatives in Ohio were not thrilled with most of the election there, but it's great work. Elizabeth, you've been doing this for a while. What um, What's exciting to you about it right now? Um, well, I just need to say that it's uh, was actively snowing here and I slipped on the sidewalk and fell on my way to work. So for all of you with your rakes and your ceiling situations, 
solidarity from Boston. Um, yeah, I just, I'm so, so grateful for Everett's uh, willingness to be in this role and move us forward with the organizing work, uh, more love in the world in the many different ways um, that he just outlined. So as part of this, I've moved into a role of trying to support our overall strategy for our justice work. We know that people are doing justice ministry in a million different ways at the congregational level, as frontline organizers, uh, at state action networks, um, but really trying to, as best as we can from where we're at at the, at the denomination, um, to shape strategy and really push us to ask how we can play our role best in the ecosystem. Um, and I think a lot of that is about what Everett mentioned in terms of our commitment to universalism, which says that no one is outside of the circle of love and no one is disposable. And yes, there are behaviors that are harmful and are not okay. And we're also not gonna get into this thing of like pitting humanity or dignity of one person against another person. Um, and we're gonna have a spiritual spine about that. Uh, I'm thinking about that in particular as um, folks are you know, negotiating about people's humanity and this um, quote wall uh, today and uh, that we're, we're not about that and we're gonna support the frontline organizers who are moving that. And we're also gonna support our people to figure out what that looks like internally. I think that's part of my just personal passion is like, if we're serious about this, if we're serious about universalism, what does that look in our institutions? How does that look in our communities? How do we respond when harm happens in a way that is vigilant about the dignity and healing of each and every one of us? Um, so I have energy there. Uh, my work right now is to really try to help us sort through our, uh, what we're calling our intersectional priorities, which is basically just a way of saying, bless, bless, bless all the justice work that people are doing. Uh, that's an expression of our Unitarian Universalist values. And we're trying to have some spiritual discipline around prioritization and really look at work around fighting criminalization, um, electoral justice work, expanding democracy, uh, and our environmental and climate justice work and our LGBTQ and gender justice work. So obviously that's wide and also um, I think helpful for us and, and hopefully helpful to folks in social justice committees, folks in their own personal lives who are like, you know, I have 5 million emails in my inbox. How do I decide what to move forward today? Everett, have there been surprises for you as you've gotten into the work uh, that, that you'd like to share? <laughs> Again, I said I've only been here since December, so uh, and I, I want to stay. And uh, I think the surprise is uh, for me is the willingness of folks to come with their full selves um, and to explore and to really be faithful um, on their own journey of political education, activism, organizing and really facing power with power. Um, I think there's, there's also, um, the other surprise is the level of flexibility uh, to really do this work. I've worked at some large um, organizations like Amnesty International and then some smaller kind of coming up organizations like 350.org where the, you know, the nimbleness um, and, the, and the heart and desire can get conflated with uh, policy and practice. But uh, within the UU and what I see on the ground, um, there's, a, there's a clear understanding of like, we really wanna hit our principles and values. Um, let's figure out how do we do this? Um, how do we uh, be porous enough to allow it both to fly, um, come in and come out? Um, and sometimes it might take a little bit more time. So um, uh, I'm still in the curiosity phase and I'm still in the, uh, in the dating phase. Uh, and so, you know, this is a really good date. Uh, we three months in and, uh, you know, it's still nice and they still like me. So, um, so I'm feeling good about that. I, I'm gonna shave later too. So I wanna stay pretty, you know? So yeah. Everett, you're hilarious. I have a question about what um, faith feeds you and what it's like for you to be, um, I'm, I'm happy to hear about your experience um, with Side of Love, but in general, what it's like for you in UU spaces. I'm curious 
and and what faith um, feeds you? Yeah. Um, in full disclosure, I'm a preacher's kid, um, and so um, I'm a preacher's kid. My mom uh, is uh, the the Reverend Dr. Karen Georgia Thompson, um, who is with the United Church of Christ. She's the ecumenical minister there. Um, and uh, what's been beautiful about uh, my mom's journey uh, and, and also my journey, I'm, I'm actually raised by Southern Black folks. Uh, and uh, we went to one of those Southern Baptist churches where um, where all that all that could be um, is and all that, you know, yeah, the unspoken things as well. Um, but that was a place of love and nourishment. Um, and my mom's journey, um, as I came out as queer, as I came out as all these different things. My mom left the Baptist church to move over to the United Church of Christ because she wanted to be in a place where um, all her children could be um, and also be loved and also know a God um, and uh, a God that loved them um, un, you know, uh, unconditionally. And so for me, uh, I believe my, what feeds me is I'm a multiple religious belonging person in the sense of I honor my ancestors. I have um, Yoruba traditions. I am Southern and, and Baptist. And so every now and again, I'm going to break out in one of them good old songs. And I'm also, I read my horoscopes and talk to the universe and birds. Uh, I play out and meditate. So all those different things um, are the things that kind of make me up and kind of feed me. Uh, and I think that um, if I am on my right path, then um, there's things that will be ease in the sense of you know, if I'm doing what is justice and what is just, um, even when I, it, even when my skin tingles because it's a new sensation, um, I can hold that ground. And so um, I still go to some UUA churches, just so uh, congregations rather, um, so that I can be in the place. Um, but I am a student of uh, James Cone and Dr. Charlene Sinclair around Black liberation theology, but also I'm an organizer and. To me, organizers are the folks who can make what we think is impossible possible uh, with heart, with grit, with love. I'm going to sit with my folks. I'm going to go turn up at the club so I can shake off the cares of the week and know that I'm with folks who are really trying just to survive and thrive. So it's all those things that feed me. And most importantly, my son. I have a three-year-old, Elijah Nason Lewis Thompson, who is my best teacher. And um, I just want him to be proud. So his smile. Is, uh, is my confidence that uh, I'm doing something right today, right now. So yeah. Thank you for that. That's fabulous. Elizabeth, you've been in UU forever, decades, millions of years. Um, I'm really curious if you see the faith changing uh, in response to activism, um, in response to the naming of white supremacy, if you see kind of the center, the whiteness in the center shifting at all from your perspective. Yeah, uh, I will answer that if then you all can share some of what you think, because I feel like you all have a really important perspective from where you sit. And, um, Oh gosh, two things can be true at the same time, right? Um, and that that feels true for me that on the one hand, especially I think around um, our commitments around universalism and how from that a practice of abolition, abolition of prisons and policing flows. Um, I think just as an example, that is a place where there is movement. I know of colleagues who serve congregations who are in active conversation about uh, divesting endowments from private prison structures about being really clear, like what type of um, armed uh, aspect of the state are we calling in for protection when we utilize policing? Uh, and those are live conversations. You know, I think about the safety team that was with us at General Assembly last year and really trying to think about okay, we, we know that we can keep ourselves safe and we know that we have skills uh, and strategies for that. Those feel like shifts. Um, I'll also say that I think there's been shift around embodiment and healing justice and um, the understanding that like many aspects of dominant Unitarian Universalist culture love to um, 
have an exchange of ideas in a content manner that might happen in a workshop or at a conference, but doesn't actually impact our bodies, our hearts, how we all in our, are in our families, how we are under pressure, how we are in our worst moments. Um, and I think folks who are doing somatic work, work around how trauma shows up in our bodies, retraining around patterns, um, all of that, which like I am a very much a learner and um, feel very like that is a growing edge for me. All of that to me says that, yeah, we're capable of transformation. Um, we can change who we are as a body. And um, dominant culture is super freaking powerful. And um, I think there are many, many, many congregations that continue to do business as usual, even though we know that that is not what our values are asking of us. We know that's not what the political landscape is asking from us. We know that's not what our ancestors or the ones who are coming after are asking for us. Um, I think a lot about the difference between culture creation and culture shift and the different skills that are required for, for both of those. And I think my personal assessment is that we are investing a lot of um, resources in culture shifting, and that is good and important work. And there's also um, a, a sort of limitless amount of culture creation that we can do, especially when we're sort of less tethered to the need for a building or the need for an endowment, um, sort of the congregation as the unit of our spiritual community. Uh, so yes, capable of transformation, things are changing, hearts are opening, uh, people are doing brilliant organizing work, and also uh, the status quo is fierce. I don't know, what do you all see? Um, I'll jump in because nobody was unmuting. Um, Exactly what you said, both things can be true at the same time. I mean, there is excitement around for me when I encounter, especially families visiting who immediately start talking about race and want their children to have a different experience than they had growing up. And then the institution is saying, here's what I think the underlying tension is. And I appreciate your framing of culture creation and um, culture shifting. The tension that, I, that I've experienced since I've been a UU, maybe not quite millions of years, maybe thousands now, um, is are we a club that we need to make sure we keep our friends comfortable? Or are we a faith community that genuinely embodies uh, universalism and loving all, we are all bound together, we're you know, from one source, Unitarian Universalism. Because what I find the tension for me, in a, I'm in a brick and mortar congregation, um, is folks, and I, I, can, I can appreciate the tension and uh, you know, folks on the board don't wanna upset their friends who are good people. Great, yes. And by not upsetting your friend who doesn't wanna talk about Black Lives Matter, racial justice, and climate justice, when I hear people say, we don't wanna antagonize people, I say, what, who, who's we? B, uh, reality is antagonizing. So are we trying to escape reality when we come into a faith community that is affirming the humanity of others? Because affirming the humanity of others right now is a revolutionary act. It's part of resistance. So what, are, what conversations are we having? So it, both things are true. I get fed when I'm on The View, when I'm um, working with people in different congregations who say, hey, come help, you know, work through microaggressions with us, come do it. And then I do a race workshop of my congregation, the people who show up, yay. And then there's still, you're upsetting us, please don't say these words. Anyway, so, so both things are true. The tension is still there. Can I ask about that dimension of love that like um, includes discomfort? Like, because Everett, you said earlier that you were showing like, this is what love looks like. And I think that there is something in that about showing that love includes challenge and discomfort and um, that it's not just about this kind of lukewarm acceptance. And so would you talk about that? <laughs> yeah, I think that, um... 
Um, one thing I just, uh, what comes to mind first is um, like uh, our, gener uh, our generative uh, contradictions, right? Um, contradictions in itself, right? If we are, if we actually learn from how we are holding our contradictions, it teaches us, it gives us different options and choice on how we want to move, um, be it forward or backwards or stay where we are, but those are all choices. And I think that um, love is actually choice. Um, I also think that particularly as I think about side with love and the work that we're doing in this social, political and economic context where, that is steeped in white supremacy and it continues to bind us, love is risk. Um, the same way that love is also loss and love is revolution. And, we'll, and it's also evolution. And so how do we actually hold this, the, all the pieces of love in a way that challenges us to make us porous, that makes us understand our edges without shame and guilt because that will actually stagnate us and make us be in a place where we don't actually flex our muscles, but begin to allow us to train and relearn how we want to enter into this world to create the place where we all can live with dignity where we can say that we're not going to sacrifice anyone for our own comfortability but to a place where we can say our policies are not strong enough we're not going to advocate for that because we have a higher standard because our humanness makes us get to that place and so when i think about love i think about all those different pieces and how we cultivate that on a day-to-day -day, on a day-to-day -day basis um, and not just when it's actually fun or kind i ain't never been in no loving relationship where it's been fun and kind every single day that i'm just like yeah i want to keep coming back to this i'm gonna love you when your breath stank i'm gonna love you when you are smelling like flowers and roses i'm gonna love you when you tell me i am hurting you because love allows us to see each other and say for the sake of your dignity and for the dignity of generations to come, I want us to change together. That is the love that we need. That is the love that we want. That is the movement that we have and that we can't have. We've seen it happen in the past. Our lineage tells us from Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, from all these other folks that loving you is risking myself for freedom. And that is what we need to do in this moment. So um, I, 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 when I think about love, I think about all the good stuff and you know all the homework cards and everything else, but also the truth in that. And that is what shapes us. And that is what the things that we need to move forward. Tim, um, well, you're a preacher's kid, all right. <laughs> Whoa, thank you. That was church. I really appreciate that. Margalee, were you about to speak? I was going to say amen, and I was going to add that I especially love what you said about shame and guilt. I do think that a lot of the work we're trying to do in dismantling white supremacy is being stunted or certainly being hindered by um, the overwhelming feeling of guilt and shame. I, we're going to feel those things because, you know, as human beings, we are. But I think we can't sit in those feelings uh, too long. We've, we've got to find a way to get past them in order to do the work, because really, we can't do anything in the shame and, and, and guilt. Um, so I, I really appreciated hearing you saying that, because I think you know a lot of what's happening right now in the work that we're doing is that, is that crippling, um, um, overwhelming feeling of guilt and shame people are feeling instead of like, hey, listen, this is where I am. This is this is what's happening, fine, okay. Now, what can I do? How can I empower others? Uh, but, you know, so thank you for that. So that, I just wanted to make that comment. And, and I think that's really true. And when I hear, Margalee, what you just said and ever, what, what you just shared so deeply with us, um, kind of the running commentary that's going on in my mind is that in our congregations, um, there are really two ways of experiencing that, right? Because our congregations, many of our congregations are primarily white, but we do have white and privileged, and but we do have, um, you know, UEs of color who are experiencing that at the same, they're not experiencing those same feelings, but they're watching this group um, go through those very 
deep, um, primal um, feelings and, and having, you know, crises of spirituality um, that, that they haven't been asked to in the past, right? Um, I think in our faith. And and I, um, I'm always really cognizant of, you know, who that we is that we're talking about, because um, I do think our congregations are going through that. And when we see our congregations, so often that default that we have in our mind is our white congregation. And there are, there are people within our congregations all the time that, that aren't experiencing it that way. And, um, and it's just, it's really hard, um, you know, serving in congregations and being able to hold all of that at the same time, right? Like being able to hold all of those different people, you know, as our ministry calls us to um, in, in discomfort and that discomfort meaning different things for different people, right? So for some people, it's the discomfort of having a life examined and for other people, it's, um, you know, having to sit very close in the same pews to people who are having to have that life examined and are looking at them and saying, shit, you're asking me to do some really hard work and I'm going to act out on that, you know, and many times act out over that onto that over, over all of you people. And, um, and, and to me, one of the things that I love about Side with Love is that it is a manifestation of our universalism. Like Elizabeth was saying, it's a, it's a, it's a actual concrete thing that I can point to within Unitarian Universalism and say, we are doing this because it is about our theology. We would not be doing side of love if we were just a country club or a social organization. You know, this, the way Side with Love is going about doing the work as faithful, as based in our theology, as Unitarian Universalists is so important to me at the congregational level because I can say, look, this is Unitarian Universalism. And it's hard, you know, it's hard right now. It's gonna be hard for a while. Um, but we're, we're not just asking you to do it just here at this church because it's just my personality. It's just Chris Rivera asking you to do this. It's just Asha Hauser asking you to do this. We're doing this as a faith. And that's to me one of the really beautiful things that I love about Side with Love and, and the work that you all are doing. So I just thank you. Um, may I just, uh, I, I, I... Because I love history, um, I just want to be respectful of um, of the folks who've come before. Um, I just want to say, you know, in 2008, uh, and actually Meg Riley, uh, lots of love and grace to you for um, breathing life into what is side with love. Um, and in response to actually gun violence um, in, uh, in Tennessee um, and the Tennessee UU saying that, you know, we like we are going to side with love. We're going to do something different. We're going to embrace ourselves and say, not, not today, not us, um, not ever. Um, and also I think it's fitting as we think about right now in this context, we're one year removed from the Parkland shooting on this day in, 2000, um, in, in 2018. Um, and as the prominence, as we're looking at violence and how violence has been shaping us. And for me, criminalization is state violence as well. Um, and that the same way as, as I think about folks in your youth congregations, the white folks who are like, you know, know what is happening to us the same way when the shootings and things happen in Parkland, white folks are like, oh no, this is happening to us, but black and brown folks have been saying all the time in Baltimore, in DC, in Chicago, this is happening to us and now it's a crisis. The crisis continues to be is that the social, political, and economic moment or the movement moment has hit where you are. But for many of us, we have been in this. Childish Gambino with This Is America is a great example of, you know, what you're seeing now is what we've been experiencing all our lives. 
and that your uncomfortability is the things that we actually live with when we wake up and we think about how we're going to approach the day. So my challenge to my white friends and family, my ex-wife, my, my, you know, is that what you are doing and your level of, of, of uncomfortability in this one moment. It's only not even a peek into what is our day-to-day -day lives and our existence, but it is it is really your work to do. Um, it is your work to do for the sake of our liber liberation. Um, and and you know the reason why I say this always again is like I don't I don't like my therapist tells me all the time. My therapist, who I love and adore, and who I pay good money, says feelings are not fact. They give us good understanding of what is happening, but it doesn't mean it's the fact. It could be, it could not be, but how do we use our feelings to move us to where we need to go? How do we use our feelings to actually change our behavior and create some new things, to actually create what is fact? And what I'm asking for folks to do, I want you to actually acknowledge your feelings. I acknowledge when I get heated and upset, I acknowledge that so that it can give me some information of what I really care about and why and where I'm stuck. And also what is the work that I'm gonna have to do so that we can get free. There's work, as my grandma would say, there's work children that we have to do that, so that we can get free and we need you to do that work. Um, and so I would love and, and my hope and my dream is that container that can, can actually expose the work that we need to do so we can get free and not just freedom for the sake of freedom, but for really recreating a place of real democracy, recreating a place where we can actually live, not just in harmony, but we can actually thrive. Um, I want to thrive. Um, and so how do we make that happen? Um, so um, yeah, keep feeling, <laughs> keep feeling, but it ain't fact, but we got some work to do. Well, this makes me think of last week, we had Nancy McDonald Ladd on who's written a book uh, after the good news. And she was talking about the need for lament in our congregations and, and also atonement, uh, genuine um, place, a uh, ritual to come to, um, you know, if you're white and you read history, shame and guilt are a pretty logical response to it because, it, you know, it's horrible. I mean, white people, you know, I have a kid of color who just looks at me all the time and goes, aren't you ashamed to be white? And I'm like, Yes, I'm ashamed of my people. I mean, my people made completely inhumane choices over and over again. But what do you do with that? So you can wallow in it, you can writhe in it, or you can say, my ancestors want me to do better. My ancestors are calling me to, to move forward with that, not to move back and sink into it and just writhe. That helps nobody. So, and I, and I, that is what I like about Unitarian Universalism. We're all, we're always trying, you know, we're, we're going to try. Um, but, but I'm curious if liturgy or, you know, Elizabeth, you do these beautiful prayers, how, how you see strengthening, um, yes, white people continue to make inhumane choices over and over. You don't have to read history. You can read the news. Exactly. So, um, I'm curious how you see the, um, liturgical or spiritual practice strengthening the capacity to do this work if you see and and also you've both mentioned culture creators and i'd love to hear you talk about where you see that creation happening yeah um i'm experimenting with something i don't know how it's how it's going where when people ask me if I'm willing to preach or lead worship, I say I would be would be honored to lead worship for you if it's connected to justice work that you're doing. So I'd be honored to lead a grounding and centering before you go out and door knock. I would be honored to hold a processing space for people to lay down pain after folks have witnessed um, at the edge of the systems of state violence in courts or in prisons um, or at the border. Uh, but I'm really trying to hold my, to, to embody the values that I hold that our spiritual work is not different from our justice work. And that really the work that we do around liturgy, around prayer, around song, that is so that we can live our values in the world. And those things are not separate. Um, 
And, you know, in our, our organizing strategy team, we're having super live conversations about like, how do we support folks to do the spiritual grounding work that sometimes we learn very well to do on Sunday mornings or in the meditation group on Wednesday nights, to do that live in motion, um, wherever we're at. When someone says a white supremacist thing in the board meeting, in that moment, um, when we watch a cop pull over a young black man in that moment. Um, so, you know, a lot of that looks like, okay, like what are the songs that we can sing to regulate our um, anxiety, uh, fear? And for me, those are often songs with fewer words, with easier melodies songs that I, movement songs that were made for people in motion. Um, and, and also from faith traditions uh, who, that really excel at that like weaving of the, the sacred and the ordinary, uh, the day-to-day -day life. So um, the other thing is like, for me, I can't do the work of crafting liturgies that meet our world if I'm also not in our world. And I don't know about you all, but I often feel this sort of pressure to be like somewhat removed, like, okay, because I have a denominational role, I'm going to try to be like the expert. I'm going to like be on panels and stuff. And it's like, if I am not in court with people, if I am not with folks who are in cages, like I don't know how to come up with the spiritual sustenance that we need because then I'm not in the world. Um, so thinking a lot about like, okay, like what are the short, um, phrases? What are the visualizations? What are the, like, okay, I'm just gonna like feel my heart beat. I'm just gonna feel that in this moment, in the moment when I'm witnessing something horrific, in a moment when I'm doubting my own worth, um, so just thinking a lot about like crashing through the like, oh, the spiritual lives in the pulpit, the spiritual lives in the like beautifully rehearsed choir, even though I love both those things. Um, and yes, to lament. I mean, I attend the uh, United Church of Christ Church on a lot of Sundays um, where we have a space for confession and for assurance that we are only human doing the best that we can and there's nothing that can cast us out of the circle of love. And I, most weeks I don't know what I would do if I didn't have that. I think our, our space for reckoning moments within Unitarian Universalism is really um, small and, and can use growth. Um, was honored to spend some time with folks in Southern Arizona um, a few weeks ago and one of the people that we were with says that she carries the question of um, how well did you love and the clarity that she knows that her creator will ask her that question, how well did you love? And she carries that reckoning question with her everywhere. Um, and, and I think that propels and can make space for a lot of the risk and solidarity uh, that you're talking about, Everett. Trying to remember, Meg, was there a follow up? I know you asked about spiritual things, then I got excited. So that's great. I'm so glad you got excited, Christine. I was just um, going to affirm what you were saying, Elizabeth, when uh, Nancy McDonald Ladd was on last time. Um, both she and I uh, were raised Catholic. And I was reflecting that one of the things that I, I do miss um, about Catholicism is that uh, reflective time once a week to really reflect on how, um, how I've wronged others and how I've wronged my own soul and my own spirit. And to be able to lay that down and, um, and reflect on it in a way that isn't about shame and guilt and blame, um, but is opening myself up for the love that is still there for me but also how do I, how do I turn that 
um, into healing, um, both for myself and for others. And, um, and that I wish that we had more spaces like that in Unitarian Universalism, because um, as a spiritual practice, it's, at least for me, super important. And I think it goes to some of that immense discomfort that, that our white folks sit in um, without knowing what to do um, with. Yeah, we're gonna share from Side with Love later today um, a little bit of the story of this woman who who holds this question of um, how well did I love and um, a bit about a time when she made a choice that was less out of love and then what she did to learn and build the relationships and gain the skills to make a different choice. And part of what I found so powerful about her story was that she moved from um, making a choice that she now regrets um, of calling Border Patrol when um, a young girl knocked on her door to being able to make different choices. So like what touches my spirit is not that she knew how to make that choice initially, that she made a really harmful choice. And then she found a way to be with more love, a way to make a choice of more love, a way to make a different choice. You know, Elizabeth uh, and Christina, I think uh, what y'all both are saying uh, really, what resonates with me about that is, you know, speaking to reflection, the ability to reflect, to lament, uh, to learn, and to kind of like, be able to understand uh, and then make different choices. And to me, I always link that also to how do we move um, in, uh, to resilience and also the joy um, and to doing something all over again. So what is the practice loop, as um, folks would say, around, you know, we are making these choices, we're dealing with the, the impact, you know, good, bad, or indifferent of how it happens. We're reconciling, um, making amends, you know, forgiving ourselves, but then also at the end, how do we shake it off? How do we, you know, everything in nature shakes off when they do something, when something hits them. You know, how do we shake it off? How do we let it go through our bodies? How do we give it back to the earth, to the universe? How, however we want to define that um, and then come back into a place of joy to go back through another place of making a choice, uh, having reflection. Um, you know, as I would say, God is so gracious um, to give us an opportunity over and over again to make a different decision on how we want to move through. And for me, faith, church, congregations um, is a sacred place where, you know, again, I'm country and old. So, you know, it's a place where we go and we're able to shake off. You know, we, we sing the songs, uh, the universal songs in every key um, and no key at all. Uh, we're able to shake off the cares of the day of the world. Um, we see each other as, 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 as beautifully broken as we are. Um, and then we're able to move and hopefully we're moving toward justice, moving toward freedom, moving toward action in different ways. So um, uh, that's my hope and desire with Side With Love, but also wherever people are um, as they come into this place, that there's, there's room for everyone, um, you know, there's room for everyone. Everett, were you going to share a passage? Yeah, this is, uh, so this morning as I was preparing for, um, for this conversation, I clicked on Shawnee Nichols. If you haven't heard of Shawnee Nichols, she's a great um, horoscope astrologist. Um, and so this is straight from her page. I'm all into astrology. I'm an Aries with a Gemini rising, blah, blah, blah. But uh, she's really great. Um, but this is all about love. Um, and so she states, uh, which I called it before, love is a risk. Love is a loss. Love is revolution. Love makes clear every fear we must work through. Love brings us, brings with it every reason to make such effort. Love initiates us, leaving us forever changed, forever marked, forever awakened to what could be. The love we cultivate and the love we elevate, the love we choose to accentuate, speaks volumes about who we are and how we define our lives. Love isn't rom romance alone, but the most platonic relationships can be the most romantic. Love is the only thing worth decorating ourselves and one's life with and for. Love needs to be at the center of all we do if we are to do it for long. Love needs our actions because it starves on words alone. 
Love needs our solidarity because it shrivels up in isolation. This world has no shortages of opportunities to demonstrate love out loud. May we use each one that comes our way. May our love crack the shields that loneliness creates and may our actions create more spaces for love to flourish. To flourish. May y'all be the love that we seek in the world. Amen. That feels like a benediction. <laughs> Did, is there anything you all wanted to say? We didn't really talk concretely about any campaigns or anything. Is there anything that you're like, oh, we didn't get to talk about something that you want to bring up before we end? We're coming to the top of the hour. Yeah, I just want to do two real quick shout outs. Um, one, um, this is the Power of We, the year for the Power of We for the 2019 uh, General Assembly. Uh, please join Side with Love. We're going to be there. We have a workshop block that's going to be about uh, criminalization as well as, um, to me, I think of criminalization as the big system. So we're looking at immigration, we're looking at deportation, we're looking at LGBT or the, um, the, uh, the control of bodies um, and how we want to move people forward um, and to get in. And we will be doing a public witness in Spokane, Washington. So come on out with your side with love gear and be ready. We're going to the county commissioners and say, you will not build a jail in our name. We want our people free. We demand justice. And so we'll be lifting up the work of the Spokane, the UU Spokane, and also the Peace and Justice, the, the Smart Justice Coalition out in Spokane. So we're going to have a mighty fine time. We want everybody to come out and to be with us. Uh, stay on the lookout for all the work that we're going to be doing. Uh, we're continuing in the same um, vein of the work that, that Meg and everyone else so diligently put together, um, hitting on our three priorities, criminalization, deportation, immigration, um, LGBT equity, but most importantly, intersectionality of all these issues. We all demand justice and let's get free. Amen. Amen. Elizabeth, any final thoughts or words? Yes, to all of that. Um, and I just also want to share gratitude to all the folks who are moving work in your own communities every day. I hear the story of a person or a congregation who went to bat to have someone's back, whether that was raising money for an immigration bond, going with someone to their immigration check-in, making it happen, fundraising money to make rent for someone, um, getting that workshop for the board to shift the way that dynamics are happening around white supremacy and gender. Um, so many stories of people finding a way. So holding those two realities of like, the status quo is hard and rough and violence is killing and hurting our people. And people are fighting to be on the side of the, lo uh, the side of love. So just wanna say like, I see you, we see you. I know for me, like sometimes I'm in these moments where I'm like this road, I cannot stay on this road. I do not know how to stay in this. Um, and so also for the folks who are in that place, love and honoring um, self-love, honoring the paths we're on, honoring the fight that people are fighting. So thank you. And thank you for having us. We're super grateful. Thanks so much. It's been wonderful having you. Absolutely wonderful. My kind of Valentine's celebration, much better than flowers and <laughs> candy. Next week, we have Sharon Welch, who's written a book, new book, After the Protests Are Heard, that's really about how people with privilege can use that privilege to change systems. And so she's really looking at uh, white middle class people and what what we could do besides support people in the streets. Uh, so it's it's a really different perspective and uh, I'm excited about that. Shout out to Michael Tino with the sick kid today and much gratitude to, as Elizabeth said, everybody who's finding a way to love where you are. Thank you so much.